Good morning, everyone. Again, welcome to Brian Bible Church, uh, Grace Life Church. Uh, for those of you who are watching online, um, we're located at the YMCA in, in Evansville, Indiana, but this is our P.O. Box, P.O. Box 6033, Evansville, Indiana, 47719. And this is my phone number if you have any questions, comments, or things, just send me a text. There's a lot of different places you can find us. Our website is gracelifeunleashed.com. YouTube is Grace Life Unleashed by Dave Sigmund. So somebody sent me a um, request that how do I find you on YouTube? Well, when you get on YouTube, there's that little um, mic or magnifying glass. You get on there and you type in actually Grace Life Unleashed by Dave Sigmund. The reason I added the by Dave Sigmund, there's a lot of different sites that are called Grace Life Unleashed already. I mean, and so if you put my name on it, it'll actually take you right to our uh, site more than having to follow through and look around more than anything else. If you get on Facebook, all the links are there because you can go from Facebook to YouTube just by clicking. Uh, but we post everything on YouTube and link it on Facebook. And then we do have a Rumble, Rumble account. Huh? At subscribe when you get there. Yes. And he'll send you, he's there. If you subscribe on, on YouTube and then you hit that little alarm bell, it'll actually send you a notification when new videos are up. And then you just click on that and you're there. So there's, yeah, you're right. It makes it so much easier the second time. But if you just get on. If you get on YouTube and just go Grace Life Unleashed, you're going to get about 20 different pages that are called that. I mean, it's amazing how people steal other people's stuff, although we were not the first Grace Life Unleashed, in case you're wondering. Um, this I stole, too. Somebody else made this, and I stole it. Um, it's from, from Google, um, but it wasn't copyrighted. A lot of people have wondered, you know, exactly what is the Grace Life Unleashed, and, and I get uh, some interesting questions sometimes, and I want to just spend a second and talk about it. If you get on our YouTube page, it says Grace Life Unleashed is an outreach arm of Grace Life Church and Brian Bible Church of Evansville. We are partnering with downtown YMC of Evansville and having a church available to their guests and staff by having a worship service and a Bible study on site every week. And we're finally seeing this coming to play. And then I have the location. So this is actually on the YouTube site that people can click on and see anytime they, they want to see. And hopefully that's going to start to give us some more positive things. Um, people are picking up our, our our tracks. I had to put a whole bunch of tracks out there. Are you going to heaven again? Uh, books are disappearing. Uh, my cards were gone. So somebody's looking at our stuff. Um, but exactly what is the Grace Life? And so I want to talk about that for a second before we get to Titus today to help you understand because the, the, the Grace Life is the, I, I want to call it the mature grace message. I think a lot of people think the grace life is doctrine. And doctrine is important. And, and that's where this, this sponge is going to come in and this water is going to come in for my illustration. Um, I've always said you cannot apply something you don't know. So, so the, the goal is application. That's what we're after. But in order to get to the application, I've got to fill you with something, and that's doctrine, because you can't apply something you don't know. So we teach doctrine, but a lot of people never use that doctrine. It's there, but they don't know what to do with it. it the goal is another step, and that's the application part. So the grace life is Ephesians uh, 4 3. It's basically understanding what Christ did for us. And Paul has a prayer here in Ephesians 3 to where he. He, he's praying for the, those in Ephesus, and, and you can see where his heart's at. He says, For this cause I bow my knee, knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. And, then, and this is what his, his request is. That he would grant you, this is God, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. So the issue here is, Let's mature the inner man. Now, anybody know what the inner man is? Let me actually make it easier. What's the outer man? Anybody know? Yeah. That's the part Robin had fixed. Robin fixed her outer man. Or, or your outer woman, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Robin dropped a bottle cap on the floor during Sunday school and she went to pick it up, and uh, she did fine. <laughs> I guess your back works good. I, I said, Robin, what are you doing? I hate to see you knock your knee out or something like that. If it was a hip, you probably would have been in trouble. <laughs> so, but we're, we're not interested. Let me see. I'm not, we're, God is not working on your outer man. That is this body. Um, his, his fix for your body is a new body when you get to heaven. Okay, so 
don't you don't think God's mad at you if if you need a new knee. Um, he's not. Um, that's just called life, living in a sin cursed world and a sin cursed body. So God's goal is to strengthen our inner man. So now, what's the inner man then? It's the spiritual side. Yeah, your soul. Your 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 part that goes on forever. Okay, your soul and your spirit go on forever. Your body. You'll get a new one in heaven. That's not where God's working today. And this is how you strengthen your inner man, okay? That Christ may dwell in your hearts. Okay, what, what's that an issue of? That, that's the faith side, okay? Understanding what? Thy faith, that you may rooted and grounded in love, and may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height. And it's like, and that, that's the awesomeness of something, you know, the... It's not just, you know, two-dimensional, it's four-dimensional. To know what? The love of Christ. If you don't understand how much Christ loves you, you won't understand the grace message. If you don't understand how much God loves you, that Christ died for your sins, and what that means, you're never going to really understand the grace life. Because it's all about that love, okay? And you're going to know the love of Christ, which path this knowledge, you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Folks, understanding how much God loves us in Christ is the answer to the grace life. If you don't know that God is not mad at you, a lot of people are like, oh, God's mad. He's chastising me again, because I deserve it. And they somehow think that God has this stick. You know, folks, grace is not a stick, okay? Now, unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. We have our idea of what heaven is like. We have our idea. You know, Denny was talking about fishing in the, what, the trout stream of life. What, what scripture are you using for this? I don't even see the... <laughs> Anybody want to send me a link for the trout stream of life? That's the quote. That must not be King James. Maybe that's the problem, huh? <laughs> that's where Denny's hanging out at. I think he gets property. <laughs> so, and anyways, I understand what you're trying to say in Sunday school. Okay. Um, but we all have our concept of what we think heaven's going to be like. We all have our concept of what we think eternity is going to be like. And you know what Paul's answer is? Okay. It's exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. This is not a verse about life here on earth. This is about eternity. It's going to be, you know, not even doubling down, quadrupling down on how amazing we think it is. What are we going to be doing? I don't know. And, and that, that's the issue. But Paul says, don't worry about it, okay? Unto him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ through all ages, world without end. Amen. That's the grace life. Christ did all the work, we get all the benefits, and things are going to be amazing. We're set for eternity. Now, let's move to the next level. What is the grace life unleashed? That's the part that happens now, this side of heaven. Okay. If God just wanted you to be saved and go to heaven, I think he would have took us out the moment of salvation. You believe and boom, you're gone. Wouldn't that have been nice? Okay. Last time I checked, we're still here. Last time I checked, we're still stuck here. Last time I checked, we're still living in a sin-cursed world. Folks, this is not heaven on earth, okay? This is the grace life on earth. But God has given us the tools to succeed this side of heaven. But it's not heaven, okay? Now, in first, 2 Corinthians 1, Paul says, For all the promises of God in Him are ye. In other words, God has fulfilled all of His promises in us. We have everything we need, okay? And in Him, amen, unto the glory of God for us, okay? Now, He which establishes us. Now, that, that's a completed war, form of establishment. In other words, we're complete, okay? And I don't like the word established because no one uses it anymore, but it's a complete form of establishing. You're set, okay? There's nothing more. There's not a second blessing coming. There's not a third blessing coming. Everything you need is here now to live this grace life here on earth, Okay? <clears throat> us with you in Christ, and hath anointed us is God. Now, who hath also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul that to spare you I came not as yet to Corinth. Now, in verse 24, not for that we have dominion over your faith. Okay, now Paul is saying, 
I'm not in charge of your life. You know, and Paul's not the gatekeeper. He, he's, he's, like I say, there's no stick in grace. I, I, call, I caught Janet this morning just telling Patty she wasn't going to be here next week. And I said, you just can't tell people you're not going to be here. You have to ask permission first. Now, I, I'm, I'm being funny, okay? Under grace, are you allowed to skip out of church? Once a year. <laughs> yeah. What if you skip out twice a year? Does that make you a bad person? Yeah. <laughs> no. It, grace gives us the freedom to make decisions. Okay? There's no stick. Now, we have responsibility. I realize that. And Paul says, I am not the keeper of your faith. I am not the gatekeeper. What, you, what does he say? We're helpers of what? Your joy. Folks, we should have joy in us. And I, I, I was teasing Janet, and she knows that. But the thing is, we should be happy on the inside that people can see that in us, that we're not worried about the things that the other people are worried about. That's the grace life. Okay? And people should see that thing in us more than anything else. Next verse. Okay? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul's writing the Thessalonians, and it's probably the most encouraging opening of any one of his letters. He's basically going to tell them, guys, you're doing everything right. <laughs> okay? Paul says, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father, and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Then he says, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. And so Paul's saying, hey, guys, you know, we thank God for you, and we should do that too. Remembering without ceasing your what? And this is where Paul is saying, this is why I'm thankful for you guys. Number one, your work of faith. What, what is that? What they believe. I, I believe they had the greatest message down right. They were teaching good grace doctrine. But they did more than that. What, what's the next thing they did? Labor of love. When we have labors of love... Who are we laboring of love towards? Others. Okay? The, the, the grace life unleashed is others, others, others. I was talking to a waitress a couple weeks ago, and she told me, I don't like people. Petit. You're probably not in the right business. <laughs> she goes, people are just mean. Now, over the years... And most of us are from a different generation. And I think, not, not to pick on the younger generation, the younger generation has become very narcissistic. Now, you know, you know what the word narcissism is? Anybody know? <laughs> Scratch that from the record. <laughs> most of you don't know what he said because you're listening online, and it doesn't matter what he said. Narcissism is self-love, okay? It's they care about themselves. It's selfishness, okay? Do you think that people are becoming more and more selfish? Any of you are involved in retail? <laughs> are people, all they care about is themselves, and they're willing to step on others to accomplish what they want? I think that's true. We, we, we are becoming more and more selfish. And, and that's the problem. And I think anybody who's involved in retail, that's what it is, more than anything else. So when we are working with people who are selfish, can that be difficult at times? Because what do selfish people want? What will they do to you? They'll take from you, right? They want what they want, and they'll selfishly use you, let's say. Folks, if you're in involved in the Grace Life Unleashed and telling people about Christ, and you get involved in their lives, people will use you. You know that? They will take. Do you think Christ ever felt used when he walked on this earth? Maybe every day? You know, it, it, it could be difficult. All right, so then he says, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, again, hope is basically confidence, patience of confidence. We need to have patience because we have confidence, knowing that in the end, everything's going to be okay. And, and the, the problem I'm seeing in, in believers as a whole is they're getting sick and tired of this world. And I don't blame them, okay? <laughs> I really don't blame them. And so what are they doing? They're disengaging, okay? They're not getting involved. Why? Pastor, I don't want to get used. I don't want to get hurt. 
I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to deal with those people's drama. I don't want to deal with all their issues. And so what do they do? They quit. They go fishing. Wait, no, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> Are fish selfish? <laughs> I'm picking on you, Denny. <laughs> Again, I, I have no problem with fishing. The point is this. Folks, if, if God didn't want us to get involved with others, I think he would have took us home. The, the answer is we, we can't get so frustrated that we give up on others because we're here for one reason, and that's to lead others to Christ. That's really the only reason we're here, more than anything else. And so he's confident and he's happy with them because they're patients of confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. They're not giving up, okay? And in the sight of God our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sakes. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word of God in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. They, they were having issues in, in Thessalonica when Paul came along. So that you were in samples to all that believe. So this is where Paul is happy with him. He says, you guys, you guys were basically good examples of everybody who believed in Macedonia and Acadia for from, from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not in Macedonia and Acadia, but also in every place, what is it? Your faith to God word is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. People all across the, we'll say the world, were talking about the faith of those in Thessalonica. Folks, that, that's what I want from all of us. Is that when people meet us, they go, there's something about that person that's different than everybody else. There's something about them that, that they're just, I can tell they're, 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 they're happy on the inside. They're, they, they're not narcissistic. They're, they're not selfish. They, they put others ahead of them. They, that's the grace life. Others, others, others. And I run into a lot of really nice grace people that tell me this one thing. Pastor, I don't want those kind of people in my church. They're troublemakers. And I went, you're right, but you're wrong. <laughs> you know, it, it, oh no, I, I like our church. It's small and, and everything's happy and there's no problems. Is, is that the grace life? Is that really what? And for a lot of people, the answer is, yeah, I like that. Folks, that's not right. And, and that, that's why we need to take that next step. And, and there, when I was in Florida, a guy came up to me. He goes, Dave, he was visiting. People in your church have a lot of problems, don't they? And I'm like, yeah. He goes, I don't like that. I'm used to going to a church where nobody has any problems. And I said, you weren't going to a church. <laughs> he had a home Bible study where it was four families, and they all knew each other, and they came and they had donuts and coffee, and they basically had Bible study every Sunday, and that was a church. That wasn't a church, folks. That was a clique. That was a cult. Churches are, you know, you go, you're outreaching. You know, it's, what's the number one thing that God wants from us after we're saved? We tell others about Christ. It's evangelism, evangelism, evangelism. That, that's the goal. That's, that's why we're still here. And you're going to have to go to them. They're, they're not going to come to us. Okay? I have yet to have somebody knock on my door and say, I, I, was, I need Jesus. Can you tell me about him? You know, usually you have to go to them and present Christ to them. You know, I, I wish they were banging on their door. But Paul's so happy because he doesn't have to fix anything. They were doing what they were supposed to do. So that, that I find that interesting. For they themselves show us <clears throat> what manner of entering in we had unto you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven. Isn't that what we're doing right now? Yes. We're waiting. Some of us are waiting patiently. Some of us are waiting impatiently. And some of us just don't have a clue. But that's where we're at, okay? Whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Again, what wrath did Christ deliver us from? Anybody know? Wrath of, wrath of God, which I believe is hellfire and brimstone. You know, none of us are going to hell. We deserve to go to hell, but we're not going to hell because of Jesus Christ. Now, shouldn't that alone motivate us to tell others about Christ? You think so? So the grace life unleashed in one verse. And I know I'm just like Dave. You're, you're still talking about this. Is basically this verse. I believe. If I had to narrow it down to one verse. And now abideth faith, hope, charity. And, and the, the thing here is this word charity. That's a word that a lot of translations mistranslate as in love. 
although charity is love, but it's a different form of love. These three, but the greatest of these is what? Charity. Here's the answer, folks. Faith and hope are supposed to lead to charity. A lot of grace people have faith and hope. They know what they believe. They have confidence in what they believe. But they don't like the charity part. Because the charity part demands that they get their hands dirty. The charity part demands that they get involved in the, the muck of this world, which is not getting any clearer. And it's not fun. But folks, if someone hadn't taken the time to talk to us about Christ, where would we be? You know, and, and that, that's, yeah. <laughs> there you go. 1 Corinthians 13. This is the charity chapter. No, oh, it's a love chapter. No, it's a charity chapter. <laughs> okay. Anybody can say, you know, James, I love you. But a lot of things, James, I want to do something for you. See, that, that's, that's the difference it is, you know, talk is cheap. Action. Charity is the action form of love. You, yeah. You know, you say, hey, I'm there for you. Except I'm busy all the time. But I'm there for you. See, see that's the difference. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and Paul here is talking about himself. Paul spoke in tongues, and have not charity. Okay, I have become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. You know what that means? You just a bah, 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 bah. empty words. And again, a lot of Christians can look at that and go, "Yeah, maybe that's my life. I talk a good talk, but I don't follow through real well." And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, and again, I think Paul could say that was about him, and all knowledge, and though I have all faith and I could remove mountains, you know, Paul's saying, I understand grace so well, I could do it backwards, forwards, and I believe it, you know, I mean, and have not charity, what does he say? I am nothing. Now, most people will go, hey, I want to move mountains. I want to have that kind of faith. And Paul's saying, no. Nah, that's nothing if you don't have charity. What do you think's closest to God's heart? I think it's charity. I really do. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. You think God cares about charity? I think it's number one on his list. I really do. Here's what charity does. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Now, I was... I was working with a guy, this was a couple years ago, and a friend of mine came with me to talk to him one day, because this, this guy was really negative towards Christianity, and on the way home he goes, Dave, I think he did enough, you gave him the gospel, move on. And I says, no, nah, I think he needs more time. He goes, no, nah, don't waste your time. Took another year, and that guy finally got saved. Took two years of me being his friend before he finally got, he got saved. That's a long time. Like, no, no, you just give them the gospel and you move on. How's that working for you? Well, I give a lot of people the gospel. Yeah, okay, but how's it working for you? How much results are you getting? It takes time. You know, this, 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 I gave them the gospel and I moved on. It doesn't work real well. I always said you can't be in someone's life until you're in their life. And that's the key more than anything else, okay? So charity suffereth long, is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Beareth all things. Believeth all things. Hopeth all things. Endureth all things. That's quite a list, isn't it? And that's a rough list. It's a list that demands time and attention and endurance. I am convinced... And I tried this, and I've had some failures. If you're willing to put the time in to really become somebody's friend and really have charity towards them, that they eventually will come around and realize that Jesus Christ is the answer. But we are not willing to put the time in. And you know what it means? You're going to get used a couple times in there. That's the part that hurts. I, I hate being used. It drives me crazy. Charity never faileth. Hmm. Really? We think it does. I tried that. didn't work. Okay? But where there be prophecies, they shall fail. Now, Paul's going through a dispensational issue here where these things are going to pass away. Uh, where there be tongues, they shall cease. Where there be knowledge, they shall vanish away. And those have vanished away. But the end of this passage is when Paul says, 
and we'll go back to it here. Uh, come on, go back. One more. My computer's acting weird. Uh, one more, and we're there. There we are. First Corinthians 13, 13 was where Paul says, Now abideth faith, hope, charity. But the greatest of these is charity. This is the grace life unleashed. This is where we want to be. This is where we want to be living today in a dispensation of grace. All right. The word charity in the New Testament is the Greek word agape. Agape is translated as charity 27 times, as dear one time, and as love 86 times. Here's the key. Charity is an idea of a love that is without gasps. In other words, it's an unconditional love. It's easy to love somebody when they love you back. It's really difficult to love somebody when they don't care. Okay? That's what charity is. Christ died for us while we were what? Yet? Sinners. Sinners. Hmm. Do you think we cared? Not one bit. So why did he do it then? Why didn't he like make a deal with us? Well, if you shape yourself up, I'll die. If you guys quit sinning, I'll die. That's not the definition of love. We are to become Christ-like in our character and become Christ-like in our actions. And at times, it's going to feel and be difficult. That's what charity is. That's why people don't like charity. Helping others is the secret sauce to a happy life. Um, I, I, <laughs> I don't like rice. You guys know that? Did I ever tell you that? But I found a way to like it. I really don't. I, if I was an Asian person, I would starve. Um, they live on that stuff. I, I love rice now. You know what the answer is? Yum yum sauce. You guys ever had that? It's basically sugar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you're not tasting your rice anymore. I love rice now. Um, the, the answer is yum yum sauce. That, that's the answer. Folks, if you really want to have inner happiness, get involved in charity. It'll drive your Christian friends crazy. It's like, why do you care about those people? Uh, they need Christ. Yeah, but they're a pain. I know, but they need Christ. Yeah, but they're just, they're just bad people. I know, they need Christ. And it's a proven fact, the longer you're saved, the less you care about those people. Because they're a big pain in the butt. Why are we still here? Yeah, those people. You think when Christ came to earth that, that we were the good people or the bad people? I think uh, we were all the bad people. Okay. Um, Ephesians 5. Be therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. You know, I love the smell of fresh bread. Anybody ever, when you make fresh bread, invite me over, okay? <laughs> Something about, my mom would always make bread. Um, not anymore, but I remember growing up, she would make this big pan in the oven, and then she'd have to get out and punch it. We used to be able to help her, punch it as the yeast would expand, and then she'd put it in these, she'd make like 10 loaves at a time, and then you put butter on top of it when it comes out so the crust doesn't get too hard. Oh, the good old days, okay? <laughs> the smell of fresh bread is a smell that somehow just smells good, okay? As we work with people, God's like, oh, that's great, I love that smell. <laughs> and and you know, like, those people smell. Yeah, I know. It, it, it's evangelism. God's number one thing is that all men be saved, okay? That's number one. And who's going to do that? Is God sending angels? No. He's sending us. No, oh, Pastor, that's your job. That, that is my job. But it's also all of our jobs. We are the body of Christ. We all are the ambassadors for Christ. We all represent Jesus Christ to the world, which means we have to go to them. And that can be difficult. That can be difficult. But you want to make God happy. He goes, oh, you smell good. I love it when you get your hands dirty. <laughs> okay. I, um, I, that, that's that sponge. I shingled my garage roof, and I, I saved money, and I think I killed myself doing it. I was talking to Robin. I said, Robin, you, why didn't you stop me? Because that's her job. She, she's now my um, gatekeeper. <laughs> she doesn't want the job, though. She goes, what did Robin told me? Dave, you need help. And I went, no, no, I can do this alone. Remember? 
But she didn't volunteer you, Scott. Nope, she knew better. She, she knew better. And she actually volunteered art, which didn't make any sense. <laughs> but anyways, and after I got done, I said, Robin, why didn't you stop me? She goes, you're a man. I just pointed out the obvious and then went out of life because I knew you were going to do it whether I disagree with you or not. So I'm going to need you guys to double team me next time and go, Dave, why are you shing? I have shingled three houses by myself, but I wasn't 60 years old then, okay? <laughs> That's the big thing. Um, but anyways, this is us. We're a sponge, okay? Now, are dry sponges good for anything? Yeah, they, they can. They're good for soaking up spills, right? <laughs> But if you have something you want to clean up, what do you want to do to your sponge first? Get it wet. And that may be your sponge more useful. I believe this is doctrine, okay? This is us. Now, what gets the dirt off the table? The sponge does, right? What does the wet do? It makes the sponge work better. As we put doctrine into our life, okay? The goal isn't the doctrine. The doctrine makes us better people. We want to be useful to God by being what? Sponges that are full of water, or full of doctrine. But when God cares about us, he doesn't give us a list of doctrine. He gives us a list of characteristics, which is a result of good doctrine. So the end results, I don't know if you're following me on this, the end results is not the doctrine, it's the doctrine applied to our life that makes us better people. And that's what God wants. So we have to put the doctrine in, but we shouldn't be running around being walking, talking doctrine. You know that? <laughs> We should be running around being walking, talking charity. Now, how do we get the charity? Good doctrine. And so it's, it's kind of the end results. When we, when we get our computer, what makes the programs work is software, right? But do we really care about the software as long as the program works? Hmm, right, Jan? <laughs> yeah. The software is the, the means to the end. The, mean, the means is to become better at doing something. We want to be better Christians, we need to have doctrine. But we shouldn't be spewing software to people. We should be spewing application to people, which is grace. Or in other words, they're watching this more than we realize. A dry sponge has no use. We want to be wet sponges. We're back to Titus now. Paul left Titus in Crete for, for basically two reasons. He's going to say it here. For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldst have set in order the things that are wanting. <laughs> it's like... Well, what things were wanting. <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I looked up in a couple of commentaries of what in the world that meant. Do you know what that means? I mean, you know? <coughs> things that needed to be fixed. Yeah, just stuff that's going on. You know, just anything that needed to be taken care of, take care of it. Because there's always little things going on in churches and stuff that you don't realize. It's like just putting all your ducks in order. That's why he went there. Number two is what? Ordain elders in every city as I have appointed thee. When Paul would go to churches, he didn't set up national churches. You know that? He set up local churches. And that's one thing that we do right here at Berean too. Um, local churches are run by who? Local people, okay? They're in-house rules, okay? We don't, we don't call up Richard Jordan on, on Monday and go, Richard, what do we do? You know, it's like, no, you guys are in charge of your own church, right? You know, that, some people think that's how it works. Or we don't call up Kevin Sadler or whatever the case may be. And God does not set up national organizations. He sets up local churches. So Titus was going to go there and he was going to get elders. And then the church would become totally self-sufficient in the sense to where they didn't need Paul anymore to do things. Now, how long does it take to establish an elder? Now, if you set a church up, how long does it take to, to get people ready to be in a leadership position? Yeah, some, it does really take a lifetime, but it, it's longer than a week, okay? Like, I came once, now I can be an elder. No, no, it takes time. It really takes time. It does take a lifetime, but it, it takes years more than anything else. Now, the word elder, it means old, doesn't it? Not necessarily, Not necessarily but us, usually it means older in life. Do you, would you like to have a church run by a bunch of 16-year-olds? Depends. <laughs> No, the answer is no. <laughs> it's not even depends. You're being nice. No. What, what, what's wrong with 16-year-olds? Not, nothing. Yeah, they might have a lot of really good ideas, but they lack experience. And what comes with life is experience. And so you want to have a church. And I always, I, when I, I used to go up to the Breen Bible Society, um, they're, uh, Breen, oh no, um, 
what's the name of their institution? Um, great. Breen Bible Institute? Yeah. Yeah, BBI. Yeah, Breen. And, I, and I would speak there every year. And I told the kids the same thing every year. I said, the things you're learning here is doctrine. The one thing they're not teaching you is because it's hard to teach is how to get along with people. You know, and I don't have all the answers either. But it's kind of like doctors. You know, Jan, Jan, you ever been around any doctors that have zero people skills, but they're really good doctors? Absolutely. Every one of them, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, you got to have both, okay? Folks, we're in the people business, okay? Whether you know it or not, our job is to talk to people about Jesus Christ. The way we explain it can make a difference, okay? And that's the key. We, we have to become good at explaining things. And sometimes we lack the the training in how to evangelize. And, uh, well, I gave them the gospel. I told them they're going to hell and they need Jesus. How, how's that working for you? Well, I told them the truth. Well, then you did. Well, what kind of results are you getting? Well, the guy told me he's going to shoot me next time he sees me. Oh, okay, all right. <clears throat> okay, no results. Uh, no results at all. Ordain elders as I have appointed thee. Okay? Now, these are the qualifications that Paul is looking for, or that God is looking for in elders. And the thing about it is, he's not going through a list of doctrinal things on here. He's like saying, oh, number one, he's got to be an Acts 13-er. You know what that is? He's got to be a pre, uh, pre-trib rapture person. You know, that's not on there either. Well, why doesn't Paul care about that stuff? Do we know why? It, it's there. <laughs> that's assumed. That's a give me, Okay. You've you got to have doctrine in place before you can have application. What Paul's concerned about is, how, how's the sponge looking? Okay? How, how, this is the person. Now, how, husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. People have always said to me, so can, can an elder be disqualified if all of his kids are in prison? Hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I would say if all your... Now, granted, if you have enough kids, you can work the percentages. That's why I had five. <laughs> I'm being funny. <laughs> if, if you only had one kid and he's in prison, you were a total failure. Versus if only one of mine are in prison, only only <laughs> what's one fifth? <laughs> no, the key is if you want to, and, and I, I hate to say this, but your parenting skills do affect your children. Um, I don't, I don't want to say 100 percent, but. By the time your kid goes to kindergarten, his moral ethics and values are in place. That's why the state wants your kid before kindergarten, okay? In other words, your personality of your child is in place by the time they go. Where do the kids learn the personality before they go to school? Home. Home. I see it all the time. Especially with kids on school buses. When it comes to how they disagree with each other. Do you know how kids learn how to disagree? From watching their parents disagree. If every time daddy gets mad, he punches the hole in the wall, what's little Johnny going to do when he gets mad? Punch a hole in the wall. Why? That's normal. No, it's not. But it's normal to him. You know, I, I told you a story before. I was, I had a kindergartner and a first grader on my bus, and they were having a fight one morning. And if you ever, the, the number one thing that little kids say to each other is, you're not the boss of me. Joel, your kids ever say that to you? <laughs> And the key is, the older you are, the more authority you get. So a kindergartner can't tell a first grader what to do because they're too young. They, don't have, they have no credibility. <laughs> but a first grader gets to tell a kindergartner what to do because they're older and wiser. But number one is, you're not the boss of me. It drives me crazy. I just want to laugh every time I hear it. Um, but they were having this fight, and they were using words that I didn't even know. Now, granted, I, I knew them, but they were like, ooh, I, I didn't know kindergartners and first graders knew these words. I mean. Words that are not words we use ever. They're just derogatory and, and evil. And I, I pulled them aside and I says, what makes you guys think you can talk to each other like that? And this is what they said. When mommy and daddy fight, that's what they say to each other. Drop the mic. These kids are messed up for life. Okay? Normal is what normal knows. Okay? The things, and, and these kids are like sponges. Remember that, Danny, with your grandkids. They're watching you, you know. Uh, there's that song where this kid gets mad and, and he starts swearing and, you know, the kid goes, I want to be just like you, Daddy. You know, and in the end, he's praying like Daddy because the Daddy realizes that my kid's watching me. 
and, and the same thing, your kids know how to handle conflict. They learn how to handle good things. They learn how to handle bad things. They learn how to handle work. You know, all these things are things they learn as a little kid just by watching you. And uh, overall, I'm pretty proud of all my kids in all these areas. They've done real well um, by just watching, and, and hopefully that, that's a positive for, for Lori and I. All right, so he's concerned about the kids, all right? The bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not soon to anger, not given to wine, not striker, not given to filthy lucre. Th these are characteristics of their lifestyle of what motivates them. Or basically, they're well-rounded Christians that aren't crazy, drunkards, hitting people, and not concerned only about the last dollar. This is the whole world he just described here, <laughs> okay? Um, this world's crazy. Um, I, people fight over things that don't even make any sense anymore. But, now this is a positive, a lover of hospitality, okay? Well, what, what's hospitality? It's good to others, okay? Now we're back to this charity thing again, okay? A lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able, but what? By sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince. Now we get to doctrine, after the lifestyle, and the answer is yes, because the doctrines that give me the lifestyle is what happens after you put the doctrine in. So the number one thing that grace people are missing more than anything else is what God's after with doctrine. He's not after mobile doctrinal arguers. He's after people who have charity. And so if we, aren't, we don't have charity, we miss the whole point of the doctrine. The doctrine's supposed to lead to charity, not to intellectualism. And we, we turn to grace. It's better than it used to be. Years ago, grace people would fight more than anything else. I mean, you remember that, Danny. These conferences were just big fighting matches. It's like, who's smarter than the next person? Folks, that's not the purpose. The purpose is application. Others, others, others. That's what God wants. And yet we're fighting about the software, what we're doing. That's the issue. Doctrine leads to application. And that's where the, the grace movement has failed at application. They're really good at doctrine. And I have to say, we've done very well to doctrine. We get an F on application. You can't make application happen. That's the problem. You know that? I can tell you to have charity. Can people tell when you're faking it? You, know, you ever tell your kids? I do, do this with my kids all the time. Tell your brother you're sorry. Sorry. Yeah, and mean it. <laughs> They're lying through their teeth, you know. It, it, it's, it's, you can tell when a kid is faking it. You know, well, you got to fake it until you can make it. There's a lot of people that are faking their whole grace life and people can tell when you don't really care about them. I, I find they can, okay? Here's the answer. This is what spirit-filled people do, okay? The fruits of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. That, that's a pretty well-rounded person, isn't it? <laughs> I kind of like that person. They're not a hothead. They're not going crazy. They're, they're someone you can talk to, someone you can have a conversation with. Um, that, that's what good doctrine should lead to, okay? And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. This is like, hey guys, we're saved. Let's start acting like Christians. Let us not be desirous of vain glory. That's that narcissistic problem. Provoking one another and being one another, that's, that's pride again. It really becomes down to, do we have an attitude of gratitude about what? About what Christ has done for us. Who's our example? Jesus Christ. What did he do? He died for our sins while we were yet sinners. We are to become Christ-like in our character. When Christ came to earth, you know, he came to earth as a suffering servant. Do you know what we're supposed to be? Suffering servants. That's it. Well, that's not fun. It, it's, it's the grace life. And it'll create a peace within you that I cannot explain. Seriously. Do I have bad days? All the time. Do I have good days? All the time. It's called the grace life. Okay? But I know how things are going to end. And they end really well. Amen. Okay, really well. And if you ever had the opportunity to lead somebody to Christ, and if you haven't, why not? It's the coolest feeling in the world. You kind of feel like you did something good for once. 
Jesus Christ did all the work. You're just a messenger. But if you've ever had the opportunity to lead someone to Christ, folks, that's where you want to be. That's that sweet smelling saber. Gratitude is the best medicine that heals your mind, your body, your soul, and attracts more things to be grateful for. That's the grace life, an attitude of gratitude. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the grace life. We thank you, Lord, for the grace life unleashed as we get involved in people's lives. Lord, it's not sometimes as much fun as maybe we think it is, but folks need salvation. The world needs Christ. They're running away from it. And Lord, we're the vehicle you've chosen to use, and we thank you for that. Sometimes not as much as we maybe should, but Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to tell others about Christ, about the hope that lives in us. And Lord, we pray that the world will see that peace in us, that the world will see that faith in us, that the, the world will see that charity in us, and they will want what we have too, which is Jesus Christ in us. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you, folks.